Welcome to another Bandology interview. Bandology is a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to more music for more kids via education, collaboration, and community. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Bandology's podcast, What's Your Forte? As always, my name is Sandy Wright, the Education Manager, and today I have the wonderful pleasure of talking to Dr. Rebecca Jordan Miller, um, the Director of Laurier Academy of Music and Arts, Music Therapist, and so much more. Uh, how are you doing today, Rebecca? I'm doing fantastic on this snowy Tuesday. It's yes. Awesome. Um, at time of recording, it's the first major snowfall. I got to scrape my car after this. <laughs> um, so tell us, can you tell me a little bit about like what you do, a little bit about the Laurier Academy of Music and Arts, sort of what you've got going on as like, what is your role as a music professional? Okay. Yeah, for sure. I'm the director of the Laurier Academy of Music and Arts. I have been for the past uh, three years. I was a piano instructor and music therapist at the school um, since 2015 when I moved back to Canada from the United States. And um, this school was founded by Garth and Marjorie Beckett. It used to be called the Beckett School and then the Beckett School at Laurier. And um, they were longtime music educators in this community and uh, we're on the piano faculty at at Laurier and the Faculty of Music, and um, we're, we're hugely influential, I think, in a lot of the sp specifically uh, piano instructors' lives in this region and province. Um, and yeah, so that was one of the reasons that drew me to the school was the long heritage of um, music education and just the philosophy, I think, and importance of community that this school has always had and continues to have, and it continues to grow as we grow. Um, so uh, we became the Laurier Academy of Music and Arts um, this past spring in uh, June of 2023. And um, just so we can include more arts, we've just started some new visual art programs, uh, hope to eventually add dance and uh, spoken word um, and literature and all of that, all, all of the areas of the arts represented here. So it's, it's a great place to be. Um, I'm passionate about music education and uh, music education led me to music therapy, which uh, is why I'm in Kitchener Waterloo because I did my uh, master's degree at Laurie in the wonderful music therapy master's program. And um, so, yeah, the two two domains of music education and music therapy um, have always been, uh, I think, I realize now as a music therapist have been kind of part of my journey since I was a very young pianist growing up in uh rural Ontario, the town of Wyerton. So I don't know if that answers your question. This is a little bit about That me. definitely does. I remember I went to the Beckett before it was part of Laurier, Beckett School before it was part of Laurier, when I was also starting a piano. So it's a pace that is sort of also special to like my time. Um, there's <laughs> the instructors I had there still work at Beckett, uh, <laughs> um, still work at the Laurier Academy of Music and Art, which is uh, very cool. Um, but you mentioned you sort of started your life as sort of a young pianist. So can you tell you, tell me what sort of where you started learning music, what your first instrument was, I'm going to guess piano, and then sort of what drew you piano. to pursue yeah. that as a career? <laughs> yeah. So um, again, I grew up in uh, the tiny town of Wyerton, Ontario, which um, has, has a pretty booming artistic, uh, climate and culture. Um, I think the beauty of the Georgian Bay and just the surroundings really, um, foster creativity. Um, but I was definitely in the minority of, as a classical pianist for sure. Um, and my journey started, uh, with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who actually won, she, she played piano, learned by ear and won a piano, in a jelly bean guessing contest, believe it or not, at wow. the local store. <laughs> and um, so I, as a young child, um, my parents are not musical at, at all, and but they loved TVO. And so in the good old days, they would put it on TV and Carmen was playing. And I was about three years of age and I started, they had an old upright that one of my older brothers was, was playing around with. And I started to pick out the themes of Bizet's Carmen, just by ear on the piano, it's kind of plunking around and my grandmother was visiting and she says, you got to get that girl in some piano lessons. <laughs> so uh, that's how I started. And um, yeah, and it was always, uh, I had really wonderful teachers who just knew how to um, push me, inspire me to be, um, to work diligently at it. Uh, and it was always just, it was a real love. Practicing was never a chore for me. Um, and uh, I loved performing and that's what kind of just started started my career path for sure. 
Yeah, that's awesome. The sentence practicing was never a chore for me. It's entirely foreign to my own experience. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, it's that's very cool that I always love hearing the stories of like the moment because a lot of people have that moment of this is when someone was like, you should take piano lessons or you should take guitar lessons or something. Yeah. And that sort of starting thing. And it's always cool. Um, though managing to pluck out Carmen is not one I've heard before. That's yeah, that's not know. easy. That's, no, it's that's, that's, that's real stuff. It's um, not easy. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> that's Maybe definitely. I don't know, but anyway. Yeah, no, I definitely uh, had to do that. Yeah, I think we had to do it in university. We had to sing again. That was hard enough. Um, so when you had a, you obviously took piano lessons. Um, how did that transition in, and maybe who influenced you as you were going on to like push you into, I'm going to do this as my job and I'm going to keep studying and I'm going to keep exploring. And then I'm going to actually move forward and, you know, build the career that you've made for yourself so far. Yeah. So I think and I talked about my teachers just being huge influencers. I think, um, cause I was involved in like a community children's choir as well. And my, my piano teacher was actually the conductor of that choir. And so I think she saw, saw me in a couple of different um, music, I don't know, leadership type kind of, she saw, she saw the desire for me mm -hmm. to communicate. And, and I had kind of the ease of communicating about music. And so she had recommended that I start trying to teach. So I started teaching piano when I was about 14 in high school. Wow. And, um, and I just fell in love with it, I think, uh, because I I loved the instrument. I loved the process of learning and really um, just uncovering little gems of what a composer may have been trying to communicate to an audience and sharing that with, with other people. And um, so I think that's what started my path on, on teaching is just realize how much I loved it. And then I had another teacher once, um, my, my local teacher said, okay, you're moving into advanced repertoire. I'm going to send you to a teacher now in Sarnia in, in London. So I was driving every week, <laughs> Sandy, my parents drove me three hours, one way for lessons. Um, oh my which God. Just, yeah, phenomenal, right? Um, I missed every Friday of of my entire high school career. <laughs> so That's pretty um, good. Was, That's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. It was no wonder I love piano so much. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that teacher uh, really taught me how to present um, music. So when I was like 16, I was driving across the border to St. Clair College and doing like a lecture recital for music students there. So I think I had teachers that saw certain things in, in me with like outside of just my music learning that mm -hmm. put all of the pieces together to make me see, oh, this, this can be more than just me sitting in front of a piano for six hours a day and then performing. Yeah. There's more to this that I really enjoy. Um, and so I think, I think that was what really made it clear to me that I wanted to have some kind of profession in music. I, I wasn't sure what that would be. Um, until I went into my undergraduate degree, but I had some little inkling, inklings of ideas. That's pretty amazing. Those opportunities, they th driving three hours for a music lesson is wild to me. Yeah, I struggled okay. to walk from my high school down from, <laughs> which was just outside of downtown, downtown to where the Beckett school was at the time, just to take the lesson, um, that I had. Uh, but that's, that's amazing. And those opportunities sound really cool, especially the opportunity to really present yourself and also Starting teaching that young has got to be a very strange experience of being barely a teenager <laughs> and dealing with like kids who are not that much smaller than you um, yes. learning yeah. piano. I can't imagine. I struggled to get eight-year-olds to respect me and I'm a grown adult. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I think it was, uh, it was, it was fun. And I think maybe like the, the, the age actually made it, um, like I was walking through the learning with them. And I think mm -hmm. that maybe made it, I don't know, maybe made it easier for them, easier for me to kind of connect with them. Yeah. That sort of same impact you have with like reading buddies when you go have grade fives come in yes. to like read yeah. grade ones. Exactly. You're sort of they're you're close enough that they feel like it's more older sibling than random sort of adult that is trying to get on board. So yeah. that would be cool. That I can see that being really useful. From there, um, can you do you have any as you moved into your undergrad and then beyond that, what sort of stands out to you as like highlights of that, either your career or your education, the things that sort of go, wow, I'm really proud of that, or that was a really cool thing I got to experience? I think um for me, 
like my my teachers have always played a really significant role. I've been really fortunate to have a lot of just really um, excellent teachers who took a personal investment in all of their students. And Mm -hmm. um, when I went to Eastman School of Music in Rochester when I was 17, and I think there I experienced some very hard aspects of life in that I realized I came from tiny town of Wyerton, where I was a little bit of a freak <laughs> in my love of classical music. And now I'm in this conservatory where there's just phenomenal, like there's, my classmates are winning international competitions. And so I think it was the first time that I really began to be afraid of performing because mm-hmm. of the pressure that was as- assigned to it in that kind of environment. Yeah, And I think that has shaped me as a teacher in, um, and being able to kind of process those emotions with students and um, make them very aware that this is just a moment. It doesn't define you. It's not like life or death if you have a performance that might not be the best that you want it to be. Um, And I think that's what led me into music therapy was because in my doctorate work, I focused primarily working with the sports psychologist. I focused on what what is involved in making a well-rounded um, enjoyable performance experience in like preparing this, the psyche for that preparation. Mm-hmm. And, and I, that's what led me to music therapy because I started to see so many direct correlations between the brain and how music affected the brain and physiology and all these things that just really excited me. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, the awful experience of experiencing just the, the petrifying, <laughs> um, Fear of the stage in, in yeah. my formative years in that conservatory, I think, was really a positive because it, it made me, it, it helped me work with so many different students through that same. And I don't think if you experience it, like my teachers that I had at Eastman, it wasn't really part of their story. So they no. didn't know what to do with me at all. You know, so I think having that, I think, has really helped me as a teacher, um, having students avoid the same kind of trauma that I had to experience (laughs) yeah no that's definitely that is a like from a pedagogical perspective a very generational change that I've noticed in like my peers but also even in my own experience I had a range of teachers I took piano lessons I took clarinet lessons I took vocal lessons don't ask me to sing um because that's the place I get most scared but that was also the teacher that was most interested in helping me feel less scared and yeah. most engaged with that. And that was so different from the other teachers I was having. Not that they were unapa- un, like empathetic towards my experience, but they were definitely, there was, diff- I got to have those like variety of experiences and that's what sort of helped me. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. One of the questions that we always try to ask is, um, why is music education important to you? Because you spent this time, you've developed, you moved into music therapy, you run a music and community art school. Those are the kind of things you've sort of invested your life into that. And if you had to sort of pluck one thing and way to sum up why it's important to you, how would you describe that? It's hard to sum it up in one area. Oh, though. yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, there, there's, it's like a multifaceted, um, mm-hmm. I think it has a multifaceted level of importance, especially well, for both children and adults, I think I've just, um, I've gone through, because we're trying to promote adult education here as well in adult programming. And um, I've actually been speaking with a lot of our adult students. And for them, it's like this, they may have had either really positive experiences, children or really awful experiences, children and lessons, but they're coming back to it always as like a way of, a way of community. And, and I think music can bring people together in such special ways that words, um, you know, reading together, like there's so many other avenues of group activities that just aren't as impactful Mm -hmm. as making music with other people. I think maybe because of the emotional or the aesthetic properties of it, it's a mystery really. Um, But that sense of community that can be experienced in music is is just so special. Um, From an educational standpoint with children, like I have seen, I've worked with um, especially with my work in music therapy, um, there's things in music that children who may struggle in so many other areas of life, whether it's academics, um, whether it's any like cognition or kind of physical challenges, that they can still meet with their peers 
ears and experience music the same way. It may feel differently. They might not be performing on a stage, but they can make music together. That is one thing that is universal. Everybody can make music. And so I think from um, like a, a level kind of playing field with, with children, I think music is just a fantastic resource to really um, bring that commonality and bring children from many different um, walks of life and experiences together. I mean, I don't need to tell you all of the, um, like, there's just so much research out there, obviously, to support <laughs> music education with brain development and fine motor and gross motor and all yeah. these scientific things. Like, it's just, um, there are so many, uh, so many reasons why music education is so vital. But I think for me, the the biggest, and this is why I've I could teach at home and it would be really easy if I could stay at home. I wouldn't have to go out on the wintry day like today, oh, yeah. but I wouldn't have community. And I think that is the thing that music most significantly means to me and why music education is important is to, to bring community um, together under one roof. And, uh, and I think that's, that's what's just so special. Yeah, no, definitely. That's one of, that's one of the things that drew me to being in doing my degree in community music because that was my master's degree because that was in the bit that I was sort of always felt connected why I did music over say doing English or which was the other thing that I cared about um reading and like writing the kind of things because I was like well if I do English I'm going to sit in a book and then I'm going to talk about the book and then I'm going to go home and read a book alone and then I'm going to talk about the book and then I'm going to go home and read a book alone and then I'm going to talk but like it was very I just I visioned a life of solitude um it's also the reason I didn't become a piano uh major um <laughs> uh, so that I could play in an ensemble well, that wasn't no. that wasn't choir and I now teach piano which is uh <laughs> life has a funny way of coming back to you. Um, but, uh, it's definitely important and it's something that we value like at Bandology. That's sort of yeah. one of the big things that's yeah. in our mission statement. Um, there, uh, also if you, anybody would like any resources related to that kind of research, we have a bunch on our website and we offer, a, you can download a PDF of our infographic or you, if you're, you know, in one of our Guelph, Kitchener, Halton areas, you can, we might be able to drop a flyer at your school or something. Um, but no, it's very, I really like that sort of sentiment of like being in community with one another. And that's one of the cool things and why we do stuff like camps, mm -hmm. um, which has been really fun. And one of the things that I've been really excited about getting to do the last couple of years, especially because it is at the place I took music school lessons at when I was a kid, um, is our March break music camp with yes. Gloria Academy of Music and Arts, which is super exciting. It's super exciting. And it went so like last year was the first year that we did it and it went just so smashingly well. Um, it was so much fun because that is often a time when this building is the quietest. Mm -hmm. And so it was so excellent just to have have the rooms filled with lots and lots of sound. It was it was great. Yeah, no, it was really wonderful. It was great. You guys, we got to work with some of the instructors at uh, Lower Academy Music and Arts, and they were awesome universally with the kids, and it was really wonderful. And we're really excited to be back this year, um, this March break, which I think is March 11th to 15th. Um, uh, registration's open now, by the way, um, if you Check would like, out. on our website. Um, but uh, it's one of my favorite things that I get to do in the year um, because I it's just it's very different than our summer band camps in a lot of ways, even in the junior parts with the age overlap and getting to take the kids into a concert and go to Laurier and see like a class is one of my, is I think really cool, especially when they're really young and don't really have a concept of what university is. It's a really interesting sort of like experience for them to be wandering through the halls um, of an institution that is not on March break at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love the fact also that your group, like a lot of the camps that we do as well, have like high school students, uh, volunteers. And that was just like, um, I think it's so it's building that mentorship that I think we like to see in community and kind of yeah. providing those high school students with an experience like, oh, I want to go into music or music education. Right. Like, I think it's a really great window for them. Yeah. And our music mentors are um, one of extraordinarily important to us in the terms of how much they're helpful, but also how much we get to see people grow. And we've had kids go from campers to music mentors to employees like who have worked here for in our summer season, um, which has been awesome. And one of our mentors from last year has come back to the, our summer band camp in KW and is going to come back this year 
to March break and is trying to convince one of our campers from summer to also come back as a music mentor for break. So there's a sort of ongoing cycle that we get to see, which year over year, which is always, I think, one of the cooler bits. And to have kids come back and be like a foot and a half taller and be very confused. Um, uh, that's the thing. So our last kind of couple of things. Um, one thing we like to do with everybody is ask, uh, do our fast five questions, which are like quick fire, rapid fire, trivia questions. Um, if it takes a second for you to think, there's no actual timer, but the idea is just like as much off the top of your head as possible. Um, just to learn a little bit about like what you like, what's something cool about you, stuff maybe people um, don't get to hear in a normal music interview um, <laughs> and some stuff that everybody gets to hear in a normal music interview. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is cool. really stressful, but I'm ready. It's okay. Everyone says it's really stressful and I feel like I need to change my pitch because I don't mean for it to be stressful. Um, question one, favorite movie soundtrack? I just heard the Grand River Chinese Orchestra do a uh, excerpt from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I love Tandon. So I think that is right now my current top good oldie music, movie music. Very cool. That's very fun. I don't know that one super well. So I will go check that out. That's on my list. I just got my Apple music replay for the year and the amount of minutes I've listened to music was concerning. <laughs> um, what is one instrument that you wish you played? Cello. Absolutely. I think it's like a standard question for pianists and they, they almost always answer cello for some reason. To be know. honest, I've asked that question every single time I've done one interview with you and I should do the math, but I'm, I'm close to 80% of people say cello. It's just so, it's just like hugging such just a beautiful. Yeah, there's something musical. very emotive about it um, that's really warm. And that's really, uh, that I also, like it's one of my answers. If I wanted to learn a string instrument, I'd want to learn cello over yes. or a, a bowed string instrument. Um, I want to learn cello for sure. Um, do you have a hidden talent? A hidden talent? <laughs> I don't. I, I don't think I have a hidden talent. I think I have hidden facts that surprise people that I, this is not a hidden talent, but I am a thrill seeker, like mm -hmm. skydiver, bungee jumper. Wow. Okay. That is, that's it's kind of surprising. That surprising. People yeah. like, they like, don't see it. They don't see that side of me, but I'm definitely, if there's a thrill, I will find it. That's very cool. I always find hidden talents a hard question to ask musicians because they're like, well, I took my I hidden talent time. and now I do it in public for a job. So what do you want? What do you want? Um, we had one of our old employees used to be able to do like bounce a tennis ball like a thousand times or something uninterrupted. That's, that's uh, We made him do it in the back of a staff meeting once. It was very funny. Um, so now we have two more. Um, what is the last show that you binge watched or the last book you read or the last like big media thing that you went i'm obsessed with this oh i don't know <laughs> i don't know if i want to share this or not but i just it's because i love rob thomas and i love the dialogue and just the woody banter of it i think one of my one of my binge shows of like i'm stuck at home like really really sick is veronica mars i just i really mm -hmm. like i really like Kristen bell i like i like that kind of mystery but with, with some internet. it's just it's a good yeah. show no, absolutely. Um, <laughs> last question, which I think is one I find really interesting. What's your sort of favorite concert experience you've attended or one of the ones that like goes, stands out for you? That's a really good question. I feel like it, it always depends. There's a, for me, there's a number of factors <laughs> that play into this. Um, cause I, I love fully immersive experiences. So if there's mm -hmm. things that combine either visual art and music or like dance improvisation and music or those, those types of things, I like, and I think maybe I have a shorter attention span too. So <laughs> if there's a number of factors in a performance experience, I, I kind of, I, I, I really enjoy that. Um, there's, I don't know if I can think of an example. There is, uh, I worked a lot with a modern dancer in Oklahoma City when I was there. And we did quite a few, like, combined, like I would, I would play some contemporary music and then she would improv dance. And I think that from a performance standpoint, that was always like hugely impactful. And so anything that combines music and, and something else, I, I really enjoy uh, those kind of cross sections because it's just, it's always really interesting. That's very cool. I know that that's a combination that comes up a lot, which is that I've encountered a lot. Like the other thing that I do is 
I studied was composition. So I've run into a lot of people who performed contemporary music while someone did contemporary dance. Um, and I think that's a really cool, it's always a really cool experience to see. And also to sort of, we did a session with the ballet school, at my, the conservatoire I studied at for grad school. And it was very, very cool. Um, it's also wild because all those people are, in, all the students are in high school and at sort of nearing the peaks of their like heading towards like the professional world. And it was very strange to be trying to write music for people who are near the heading towards the top of their field and so so young um because it's a very like they can do amazing things and they're also talking about tiktok yes, <laughs> kind of thing yeah. and that's yeah. a that was a very jarring uh thing for me uh back then um but that's awesome that's very cool i thank you for answering our fast five questions i hope it wasn't too stressful it was not no you you really you made it a you i'm made glad it. Not stressful. But that's <laughs> mostly what I'm trying to do in music lessons as well. So it's my sort of general <laughs> practice. Um, uh, so last couple things. Do you have any advice, sort of a thought that you would give to young musicians who are instrument interested in pursuing your, you know, t- kind of career into music education, <laughs> into music performance, even if it's just go home and practice, which is, to be honest, 50% of the answers I get to this question yeah, no, I I think practicing, yeah, it's key. I mean, it's uh, it's important, obviously, to to be skilled at you know your craft. I think yeah. that's important. But I think for musicians, I think the thing that I've always found, even like, and I'm a, a really introverted person actually, so for mm-hmm. me, this is kind of an odd thing to say, but mu- making music with other people, um, I think especially for pianists, maybe it's because I am you know often by myself, but. Yeah. Um, I think making music with others, whether it's other other pianists, other string players, wind players, whether it's improvising with other musicians, but I think that that is what will sustain, I think, careers is is that kind of camaraderie. Um, and like I, I've seen that, I think, more now with the tragic dissolution of the KW Symphony. Yeah. Um, with a number of our instructors here who were part of that symphony. And just the resilience and, and they're just out in the community, just making music with each other as that. And I think for them, it's keeping the music alive, Mm -hmm. but also I think it is part of their therapeutic processing um, as well. And so just if you have a child who might be practicing violin by themselves or practicing piano or just has an interest in singing um, and singing lessons, like get them in a choir, get them in ensembles, get them making music with other people, because that, again, I think for adults as well, I think that yeah. is the key. Even as a adult who plays in a band and spent 14 years, 14 years taking piano lessons, I'm a, I obviously I stopped doing that for a while, but I'm a much better pianist, partly because I started playing piano in a band. And the stuff I'm playing there isn't anywhere near as hard as what I was doing for like RCM examinations, but it just makes you better because yeah. you're alive yeah. and you're like in the moment, which is a really cool experience. And it's also way more fun than honestly practicing Chopin for three hours a day. It is. I'll say that. Yeah. No, it is. <laughs> um, Chopin's great. And I'm sorry to my piano <laughs> teacher for saying that because you definitely made me do that. Um, once, only once. Um, but yeah. But uh, last question is sort of your moment to sort of tell us a little bit about. Obviously, we talked about March Break Music Camp, which again, registration is open on the Bandology website. Um, sign up now to reserve your spot, March 11th to 15th, 2024, which is March Break in KW, which I'm really excited about. It's going to be super fun. We've got some new stuff planned. If you came back last year, it's going to be slightly different. Um, but is there anything else happening um, in your sort of world at Laurier Academy of Music and Arts over the winter, heading towards like the holidays? Yes. So we do, as I mentioned, we have a visual, we have a new visual arts uh, director at the school who's been doing a lot of different programs with mosaic artwork, um, with some macrame. Um, She's going to do some ebru, which is like this water marbling in the new year. Um, And she's just fantastic. And that's, it's, uh, and she, she brings like, she, she's from Turkey originally, and she makes all these, has Turkish coffee and tea, (laughs) makes all this amazing food for these art sessions. So it is a really fully immersive experience. Um, So highly recommend those new art programs. Um, 
I think we also, again, because we are really promoting group music making, and we have a couple new programs where you actually don't need to know anything about music to join immediately and making music. Awesome. And that is um, Bruce Gremo is, is offering a found sound ensemble. So this is with upcycled percussion instruments. So he's made like singing bowls and this whole gamelan array of, of instruments. And you can make music immediately with that group. Um, and then also music and technology ensemble called the Digital Groove Collective, where he's using laptops and iPads to create ensemble music and work on listening skills and ensemble skills, but using technology. Um, and yeah, so those are two new programs, but there's there's always lots going on um, right now, especially, but in the new year as well. So check us out at Laurie Academy of Music and Arts. It's the acronym is LAMA like the animal but with only one l <laughs> and uh, you can you can find all our programs on our website yes i have a bunch of llama stickers actually from your launch day <laughs> that was very fun um they're on my guitar cases actually yeah. well, i think i have Fantastic. one on each yeah but awesome thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me today it's super nice to learn a little bit more about you um mm -hmm. i am so happy that we get to keep working with Lori academy music and arts march break is going to be so fun I'm it very is. excited. Um, it's going to be really loud, yeah. so apologies in advance. Um, I think it's going to be louder <laughs> this year than it was last year. Um, uh, we've got some really great things coming up. Have a great rest of your day, uh, and thank you all yeah. for listening. Um, as always, you want to learn more, bendology.ca, at bendology.ca for all our socials, uh, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for joining us. If you like what you heard, you can learn more about our organization at bandology.ca, which features information about music education, advocacy and research, and our play a gig and band camp programs. Follow us on social media for more videos, performance and interviews on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube.